Hi, this is Mr. Barron. I want to talk to you about our second lecture in the nuclear chemistry series. And what we're going to be learning about is half-lives and radiometric dating. So let's start off with a joke about uh, two cheesy old atoms reminiscing on their days as past parent atoms. It says, when I was young, I used to feel so alive and dangerous. Would you believe I started life as uranium-238? Then one day, I accidentally ejected an alpha particle. Now look at me, spent old atom of lead-206. Seems that all my life since then has been nothing but decay, decay, decay. This really represents the decay series. A decay series was mentioned in the nuclear chemistry lecture number one, and it's a series of nuclear changes that occur until a stable nucleus is reached. So just because you are radioactive 238 doesn't mean that you decay once and then stay that daughter element. So if you're uranium 238 and decay by alpha emission and become thorium 234, you don't stay to thorium-234 forever. Thorium-234 is also re uh, radioactive, and it releases a beta particle. Turns into palladium, releases another beta particle. Turns into uranium, releases an alpha particle, turns into thorium, on and on and on, until finally a stable nucleus is reached, which is lead-206. That is the essence of that comic. So how long does it take for an atom to decay? Well, different elements, or I should say different isotopes more specifically, have different half-lives. And that's how much time a sample of it takes until half of it decays into its daughter product. So it's the time required for half the atoms of the sample to decay. Different isotopes have different half-lives. So this is how a half-life works. Say you've got the isotopic radioactive oxygen-15. Say you start off with 20 milligrams of oxygen-15. After the first half-life, you only have, oh sorry, it starts off at 20, 20 milligrams. After the first half-life, you only have 10. Then after the second half-life, you only have 5. After the third, you only have 2.5. So half-lifes are the time it takes for half of that sample to decay and to um, transmutate into the daughter product. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working on an activity in a lab related to this. And this is going to be done in the media center. So. Radiometric dating. Radiometric dating is a process that measures uh, how much of a daughter product remains to determine the age of a material. So if you can measure how many surviving parent isotopes there are in a sample, if you know what the original was, you can figure out how long time has been ticking by. Uh, a classic way to do this is with carbon-14. Carbon-12, which is more common, is uh, not radioactive, but carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. Carbon-14 is created by cosmic radiation, basically uh, sunlight, coming into our atmosphere. And what happens is they collide with an atom, creating an energetic neutron. That neutron strikes nitrogen-14, and it's captured. That neutron's captured and releases a proton that changes into carbon-14. So carbon-14 is constantly being generated by sunlight in our atmosphere. So carbon-14 stays as a constant amount. Carbon-14 gets absorbed by plants through carbon dioxide, and then animals eat the plants, take in carbon-14. So basically, every living organism on our planet is consuming carbon-14. And while they're alive, they have a fairly constant amount of carbon-14 in their body. So when they die, what happens is carbon-14 starts decaying back into nitrogen-14. If you can measure how much carbon-14 is left in a organism that was once alive, you can date it. So there's the deer, you got the carbon with the carbon-14, you've got about that much carbon in you, about that much carbon-14 because you're eating the plants, and then you die. And then over time the carbon-14 starts decaying, going away, going away, and going away. And then you can measure how much of it's left, and then that can be used to calculate how much carbon-14 you have left. That's the end of the presentation.